Now, Yeah, you really can't do that sitting down, I think. Hey, what's up guys? Hope everybody's doing very well. And what you just heard was my take on the solo in Greenlight Girl by Doyle Bramall. Doyle Bramall the second. Doyle Bramall the guitarist, if you will. In this video, I'm going to take a detailed look at how to play the solo note by note. I will also take a look at the sound I used to create the track you just heard in the intro. Now, I've also created a transcription for this solo, but this time we're not going to bother with analyzing all of the notes because it's just a straightforward blues rock solo, right? This is what it is, okay? We know what it is. So, Green Light Girl is the first song on the 2001 album Welcome, and the booklet states that it's recorded without the use of Pro Tools. So, in other words, it's just played and recorded live in a room. And these are whole takes, including the vocals. That's pretty special, I think. And uh, you can sort of feel everything happen. You can feel all the spontaneous energy and the healthy breathing of music. Now this cool guitar solo and the way Doyle Bramhall sounds uh, always came across as a little bit different in the realm of the modern uh, Jimi Hendrix inspired guitarist. This might be thanks to the fact that Doyle Bramhall plays the guitar upside down and this creates those typical bending sounds that sound like Albert King. <laughs> no, that is King Albert of Belgium. This is Albert King. You see by bending the notes up in pitch and by actually pulling them away uh, on the neck. It sort of feels different to the listening ear and I think it's fantastic. So Doyle Bramall the guitarist is actually called Doyle Bramall the second and that doesn't mean that Doyle Bramall the second is the second one who ever existed in the world but Doyle Bramall the first was his father, the drummer, and he played with both Steve Ray Vaughan and Jimmy Vaughan. And Dol Bramall the first, that doesn't mean necessarily that Dol Bramall the first, the original one, is the original Dol Bramall and the very first one who ever existed in the world, because Dol Bramall the second is also the original Dol Bramall. And one can just uh, call himself that. You can either choose to call yourself the second, uh, either informal or on paper. And I'm probably eldest, but out the 261st, I mean, at, at least in the family. family. But it doesn't mean that I'm not the original Aldous Padauda, as well as my grandfather. That's probably uh, the very first one in this family, but it doesn't mean necessarily that that should make, should make a, a very family. big point out of this, I think. But I do think that we should really continue this a little bit more and no! really try to understand this. Okay, I'm now ready to let this go, I think. So the guitar you hear on the record can be nothing else than a Fender Stratocaster, and it's probably his 1964 one. It's the one I feel most comfortable with playing live. And amp-wise, it's probably his 1968 or both of his 1968 uh, Marshall Super Bass amps. And uh, using a uh, either original Dallas Arbiter Fuzz Face or one of his other Fuzz Face type of pedals. Now, I think key to create that classic lead Fuzz Tone, like Hendrix Fuzz Tone, but still have enough cutting capability is to... Uh, allow enough clean and definition to come through. This can be a very delicate play between rolling down the volume of the guitar, working with the guitar's controls and not maxing out the fuzz on the fuzz function of your fuzz pedal and also have a very good dynamic tube and platform dialed in correctly to begin with. And this allows your fuzz to be used as a little bit of a volume boost as well and allowing the amp's own distortion characteristics to blend with the tone. Right, the guitar I'm using is a 1996 Fender Stratocaster. I mean, the body is a 1996 original and the neck is a Warmoth, kind of a baseball profile, so it's thicker than the original would be. The pickups are my old beloved Lindy Frelins. I think these are the vintage hot spec, so these are almost P90 wound, I think. They, they might be uh, sounding a little bit too dark for the purpose. I mean, they would sound thicker than original 60s spec pickup would be. Doesn't matter. 
rolling down the volume just a hair does help to make it cut a little bit better. This guitar belongs to a guitarist buddy of mine, Rishko Tibor. I will link his channel in the description. Now I've yet have to bring my bigger tube amps here to this mobile setup, this mobile studio. And uh, yeah, the first thing I try to do is just get the most out of my in the box recording gear. And the first thing that came to mind is just trying to create a very good uh, uh, preset in my Line 6 HX Stomp. And now the 1968 Super Bass amp isn't exactly in it, but you can get pretty acceptable results by choosing a, a Marshall Plexi amp platform, somewhat dark and stiff sounding, very headroomy sounding amp. And uh, tweaking the mic and the cabinet settings a bit and then bring a fuzz face or a fuzz, uh, fuzz pedal in front of it. And I must say it really works and it also sits well in the mix. I've also spent a little bit of time with Antelope Audio's own DSP amps. They have pretty cool Marshall amps in there as well. And also tried the combination with the 69 fast pedal, an actual pedal. And also tried uh, giving uh, Logic's own amps uh, a real fair chance as well again. And I must say you can definitely get somewhere with all of these platforms. And, uh, but I think the HX Stomp was uh, sounding the most realistic. It feels the most realistic. So I used that for the guitar lesson section. So for the intro, however, I did end up uh, rigging up some kind of a tiny tube amp hybrid setup. And uh, what you hear, believe it or not, is again, this Fender Champion 600 amp modified to tweet specs. I'll leave a link in the description if you know, wanna know how to do that. So you just hear the amp with a full tone 69 fuzz pedal in front of it. Now the amp, even with its uh, eight inch speaker, of course that doesn't cut it uh, speaker wise. So I uh, just uh, disconnected the speaker and that goes into a reactive load box, this torpedo captor, eight ohm version. The amp puts out four ohm, but that doesn't matter too much. The torpedo captor then goes into one preamp of my interface that goes into the wall of sound very good speaker IRs and that goes into a set of greenback dual mic greenback classic 57 and a royal 121 setup and I've backed up the mic distance a little bit so you sort of have this cutting sound but it does sound that it's a little bit in the room and the ice pick attack is a little bit deflected it works pretty well I think so only the amp sounds like this. I mean, there's nothing engaged. It's just the amp going into the torpedo and then in the speaker simulation. to look for is somewhat of a dark sound i mean there's a hint of breakup and you hear all the harmonics already start to work for you it's just a beautiful sound and some might say uh, it can even be a little bit underwhelming on the neck pickup the bridge pickups the bridge pickup is a little bit hot so it sounds different <laughs> It's definitely overdrive there. Okay, so now with the fuzz pedal engaged and I roll the volume of the guitar back to let's say three and a half ish, you get all sorts of really cool clean sounds. It's basically, it's almost the same sound as before. Get a little bit more breakup. But now you get all these cool opened up highs as well. And this is a very desirable sound. You can do many things with this. It gives you so many different nuances of rock and roll tones. but you yeah, tamed a little bit, it does still work with chords within a certain style. The volume all the way up, you 
beats will still work, they still cut a little bit. <laughs> still go all the way fuzzing things up big muff kind of a fuss I mean that's a little bit too much here but it's fun <laughs> things with a fuzz pedal you know if it's just engaged and when you roll your uh, when you roll your volume down a little bit you can get all sorts of cool uh, different rock and roll sounds <laughs> So is this a 1968 Marshall Superbass Plexi recording chain at home? No it is not. Absolutely not. But this is a very fun hybrid little tube and recording setup that still fits in a suitcase. Okay then we go to the solo lesson, the tutorial. Again I left a link in the description to the transcription I made is pay what you want so whatever. Please enjoy. Okay, the solo tutorial. I think this is going to be a lot of fun. We don't have to uh, overanalyze the things too much. Just gonna play the fuck out of it. Okay, we're going to start with the tremolo picking section. Uh, we can start with a D major triad or 10 position, and we're going to tremolo pick as if our life depends on it. It doesn't have to be super precise, but we can say we do this in 16 notes. You would count it like this: one to three, four, one to three, four, one to three, four, one to three, four. We're going to do tremolo picking from somewhere down the neck and take it up to our D major triad. And we're going to just sustain our tremolo picking for uh, the full measure. It's going to sound something like this. That will be actually too neatly played. You can just do really heavily. If you mute your bottom strings with your thumb or something, you can use your thumb to mute the low E and the A string. You can use your middle finger to mute the D string. You can uh, tremolo pick a little bit more savagely and you don't accidentally hit strings that you don't want to hear in your part. Something like that. Now, in the third measure, we play two chords. We start with our D major triad, and then we do something that sounds a little bit like an E minor. An E minor chord will be the second degree of D, but we're not gonna uh, actually play our B string. I think he mutes his B string with one of those two fingers. So we play our D major triad and our almost E minor chord. We're also going to do the tremolo picking, so now you divide your part into two sections. Again, make sure you mute the strings that are around the chord so you can play this savagely. Okay, in the fourth measure, we land on a D dominant seven chord. Played like that. Now we're going to just extend the whole bar in tremolo picking. So it's. It's weird, eh? How you can sort of, when you play it savagely in the feel, when you get the mojo going, it's sort of, it lands itself. But if you try to play it neatly, it sounds a bit like shit, right? <laughs> You use force it sounds better okay so conclusion here is those uh, first four measures something like that that was actually not savage enough but hey you get the idea right and we go to a pretty savage cool pentatonic line he plays it in 16 notes it's pretty quick and i think he plays this so what we have is once more okay to get the picking direction correct 
it's uh, pretty valuable to study all of the 16 nodes and see where you would be if you would think out all of the 16 nodes by maintaining your picking movement. And that works like this. So we're going to play the line. <laughs> And when we don't play anything or we, when, you, when we sustain a note, so to say, then we maintain our picking direction as if it would be picked. You could also pick all the notes, that would also help. But let's just try to do this with the phantom movement in the air. It works like that. On the record, it sounds a little bit like an automation move or a cut or something. You really don't hear this first B string too clearly, but I think it's there. Otherwise, it would just sound like this. It also sounds good, I think, but you can play it. You can play that. Now, on the record, it sounds a bit like... He continues with this 15 position B string. I did transcribe it going back to the uh, the 10 position and play the high E for the next line. If you want to try to stay on the 15 position, you can do something like this. Bend your first finger uh, 13 position or bend your B string here. That's the 18th position. It's up to you. Okay, for this lesson, I chose this 10 position approach. We're going to play two strings together. You actually play your B string with that and that creates that weird sound, you know? Savage sounds. All right, when we are back, we're not going to do that, of course. I'm going to play this bar before that as well. Now, I'm not 100% confident or sure that he plays this or that note. Of course, it's a very fuzzy sound, so it can be, uh, yeah, it can be a little bit hard to distinct the notes sometimes. Please leave a comment if you are 100% confident you know which one it is. Now we're going to do the Albert King ideas. It's pretty tricky stuff. I mean, for me, this is probably newish. So you play this 13th position high E string, and then you bend it a whole note up. And then do this, basically the same thing on the 15th position high E. It's a weird line, but it's pretty cool, eh? So a lot of bending there. Okay, time to rest. We're going to play four eight notes on the 15th position. Sounds like this. You can pick these down and you will have to actually pick them down because if you would think of these as 16 notes, it would work like this. Right? So this is perfectly fine to do it like that. The next line goes like this. Pretty straightforward classic blues line. And then my absolute favorite line of this cool solo, we're going to play this. So what's happening is we play our 15 position, bend the whole note up. But then we play with the middle finger, second finger, we play our 14 position and sort of correct this to get this uh, this G again, this sus. Like that. And that sounds pretty savage, especially if you hear those two strings working together, you get this like weird harmonic stuff. Now, the second time is played just a little bit differently. And the cool thing is that he plays his fourth position bent on the second eighth note of this first count of the bar uh, after that. So that, bends, that bend just hits you in your face because it's on the after beat. I'm gonna just play this whole section slowly and, and do a count in. 
so you can hopefully get a better uh, timing perspective. The transcription speaks for itself, but you know, it's, uh, it's weird to play these lines sort of separately, right? Two, three, uh, four, uh. <laughs> Okay, we're going to work our, work our way to the end of the solo. That's what we're going to play. We're going to play this on the four and so it's again on an afterbeat, which just makes it powerful. Again, you can play these two strings together to get the savage sounds. It doesn't work always consistently here. Then we go to a um, triplet section. Eight no triplets. It sounds like this. Pretty straightforward classic rock line. Okay, let me play that section of triplets once more slowly and watch the picking direction. You can count these out. These are six, eight notes. So it works like that, including our hammer and pull uh, stuff. I'm going to play this phantom movements in the air again. So you end with a upstroke. So you can start with a downstroke again on the first count of the measure behind that, after that. Okay, our last line goes like this. Something like that. In the first count of the first measure we, uh, we're talking about, I think he plays all of these notes. Okay, once more. Something like that. Thank you very much for watching and hopefully this was of any use to you. And uh, let me know in the comments if it was or if it wasn't, as I'm always eager to learn and upgrade my content making skills. Now please take care, behave, and we'll see each other soon.